Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Anna Scalera, and I'm here with Eisner-nominated writer uh, Steve Orlando and author of our new Maverick title, Silver Vessels. Uh, we're also here with comic shop owner and nonprofit extraordinaire, uh, Shannon Live of Bat City Comic Professionals. She's saving our children one comic at a time. Uh, Shannon and Steve, thank you so much for being here to take the time to talk about Silver Vessels. Uh, Shannon, feel free to take it away. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, this is such an honor, Steve. I'm a huge fan of, of your work. It's been something that I've followed for years, and I'm, I'm super excited to say that I still have uh, young people coming to it in so many different directions. We have a teen volunteer who just discovered Midnighter and Apollo uh, this year, and so you're still impacting so many people uh, through so many different channels. But I would love to, before I get into questions from all of our volunteers and customers, I'd love to hear about Silver Vessels from your point of view. Sure, absolutely. And I've heard you guys, you know, we are doing a, a kind of a, a themed treasure hunt at the store this weekend, which is awesome, by the way. So so thank you very much. I uh, could not be more thankful for that. I think that's very, very cool. Um, you know, we're often here in the comics cave making books. Uh, so anytime that we hear about stuff out in the world, it's all very exciting. Um and that's actually a nice segue into Silver Vessels because this is about stepping out of your comfort zone and exploring what's out there. Uh, with this book, when, when Madcap reached out to me, um, talking to me about the excitement they had uh, when it comes to our editor, when it comes to one of the publishers, uh, growing up in the Florida Keys, and they said, Steve, you know, we'd love to create this, this book. We'd love to build something with you that sort of shares that wonder we felt. And and from that moment, it was clear that this was going to be this sort of story about those teenage years, those those summer vacations that always seem endless. They seem as as though anything is possible, uh, and and there's such a formative time uh, for for people in their development. There's a reason why we look to that period in our lives and see stories like the Goonies, see stories like Stand by Me. Um, see stories like Stranger Things, even though many far fewer people die in this book. Uh, it's it's because that's a time of transition. It's a time of realizing, uh, you know, we love to say losing the innocence, losing your innocence, right? Learning that, you know, learning that puppies grow up uh, into dogs and eventually pass away. Uh, but it's also uh, that 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 precipice where anything seems possible, and there's an excitement uh, about starting to mature and starting to grow old. So it is. It's it's a complicated time. It's a wonderful time, uh, and it, through this book, um, it's just it's a great lens to frame this treasure hunt, uh, to frame this pat this journey of exploration and and discovery. Because really, that's what the teenage years are. What are they if not uh, a journey of discovery? So here we're taking that. We're we're making subtext text. This is about three teenagers going on their summer vacation, only to find out that one of them has secretly set it up as a treasure hunt. Uh, he is a person who sees patterns. He's he sees data. He loves books. Maybe he struggles a little bit more with people. Uh, but Josh, our lead, knows that there's treasure hiding uh, beneath beneath the Florida Keys. Uh, he sees something. He's so sure that no one else has seen, uh, and and he's able to convince his friends to go on this journey with him and prove them that prove to them that it's true. And of course, you know, there's some mischief on the way. There's people standing in the way uh, of finding the silver vessels. And one of those one of those people eventually becomes our, our leads themselves as they realize what treasure, quote unquote, hunting really means in the modern context. So it's not just a story about discovering what's inside each other. It's not just a story about discovering literal treasure. Uh, it's also a story about discovering what the real meaning of, of, of quote unquote, treasure hunting is. Uh, and and if it's really about finding these things or about uh, and, and taking them away, or if it's about experiencing them and honoring them. So, uh, you know, nobody starts the book where they where they end the book, of course. Uh, and and hopefully everybody comes out with a little more learned at the end of it. Uh, that's that's the spirit of the Goonies. You know, that's the spirit of Amblin Entertainment. And what we're trying to do is is update that for 2024. That is exactly anytime I pitch the book to people, even without saying the Goonies, everybody is like, so it's like the Goonies. I'm like, yes, the Goonies, but for your children. You know, if you're a, a Gen X parent and you have kids, this is a great combination book where you can kind of bring that love you had for the Goonies to to your, your young kids. And uh, that said, were you a big fan of the Goonies when you were younger? Well, I, you know, actually, honestly, I was always watching movies that were a little too old for me. So I was... 
Uh, I bring up Stand by Me as well because this this doesn't this you know, this uh, doesn't involve a corpse, of course. Uh, <laughs> but that's actually my my big North Star uh, for this, uh, along with the sort of more lighthearted tone of something you see in the Goonies. The irony is that I actually got stuck watching that movie on loop during my aunt's 50th birthday when all the kids were banished to the basement. <clears throat> so while I enjoy it, I actually haven't been able to watch it in about 25 years because uh, I still feel like I need a little more time. But um, I understand the concept, uh, of course. And what's the, the big one for me, of course, was always Stand By Me. <clears throat> Pardon me. Which is a little more serious, uh, but the point remains, uh, you know, going where you're not supposed to go, adventuring where you're not supposed to adventure, and seeing things that you maybe shouldn't yet see, uh, breaking the rules a little bit, but in the name of discovery. To me, that is still, whether wherever we're drawing our inspiration from, that's the teenage experience. Yeah, absolutely. And you give such an interesting uh, antithesis, antithesis to this group. You know, you have these kids who are coming into their child, like leaving their childhood wonder and kind of building that wonder that you can carry with you into adulthood. But they have a very uh, strong opposition that is working with them, against them, depending on where we are, you know, in that story. But where did they come from? Where did these, these apex predators come from for you? Uh, I mean, the apex is kind of, you know, they're inspired by, in a way, by Rene Belloc uh, in, in Indiana Jones. Uh, when you're doing a treasure hunting story, you kind of can't think about the icons, or pardon me, you can't not think about the icons. Um, but we had to, again, once again, we had to update that Belloc character and, and thematic, because obviously the apex are a group, not a single person, for the present moment. You know, um, there were dark mirrors of each other. Indy and Belloc both want to discover, you know, what's undiscovered. Uh, and both of their end games for that match the morality of the time. Mindy wants to see things in a museum. Belloc wants to sell them to the highest bidder. Uh, in this case, the, the Nazis, you know, very bad, um, still are. And while the, the optics around that have changed in the present day, you know, we don't necessarily think that a museum is the best place for treasures. They generally belong with the cultures that created them. Uh, just as we have to update that for our own heroes, we have to update the end game for our villains. So while there's a greed uh, and, a, and, a, and a profiteering aspect to the apex, um, much like the, the sort of modern hyper con, con, mm, consumptive isn't a word, uh, but it is now, I guess, because I'm a writer, but much like this need to consume that many people have uh, with the apex, they want things uh, as an expression of their entitlement. They want things essentially just because, like they say, they want to have something no one else has. Uh, and not even for a particular reason, which is the true tragedy of it. They don't have a particular respect for the things they're collecting. Um, they only really consider their own ends, which is to to own what can't be owned. Uh, and uh, essentially, the, rather than simply standing for consumption, they even stand for waste. You know, it's not as though they, despite their words, they even particularly relish having these treasures. Uh, the pursuit is the goal for them. Uh, they they want to have something so that other people can't have it. And much like Belloc said, selling the Ark to the highest bidder uh, or for his own ends many, many years ago, the Apex uh, are not doing things for for the right reasons, but the reasons have to change. We're, we're, a, we're a me culture now. Um, and as we see more and more the opulence and, and the waste of, of, of the extremely, extremely wealthy, we had to sort of update that point of view. They, once you, when you can buy anything with money, the question thus becomes, you know, how do you further set yourself apart from your already entitled, already sort of toxic competition? And for the apex, it is hunting down these things that no one else can have uh, and holding them for the mere sake of ensuring that no one else can have them, which is a tragedy. Absolutely. Uh, and makes her such a great a villain for this story. And one of the things I love that you do across all of your, your work is you are very relationship driven in how you tell a story. What do you feel makes a great relationship when you're building out character relationships in books? I mean, much like putting together like a capes team uh, when I'm at the big two, like you real relationships, uh, you know, and, and friendships don't work on people just getting along. Of course, uh, it, they work on push and pull. They work on conflict and resolution. And and, and that's how people learn about each other. So the, the trick is, of course, that once you're 
building a cast for a book or building a, a group of friends, um, it's very easy to just make them all happy and, and pleasant and get along. But you need to build in the faults that that, that essentially make us people uh, and, and and make us butt heads with each other. So um, everybody, you know, our three cast members, Hope Hunter and Josh, need uh they all have a journey they're on uh they all have uh, personality traits that are getting in the way of them achieving that and they're all they all have fears based on misassumptions uh about each other those are things you got to bake in um it's easy oftentimes uh, with the way media is today to to again just tell that happy story uh people getting along and running a coffee shop and there's a place for that but but real learning comes through uh mistakes and and, and overcoming uh, overcoming disagreements and so on and so forth so we knew where all these characters were going to end up uh and we knew that the pieces were there for them to support each other but when you are building these the, these these narratives instead of operating in real life you got to bake in the the faults and the problems uh from scratch that's how we that's how we knew that there was going to be some conflict between hope and josh early on without spoiling what happens in the book it's where we knew there was going to be a lot of fear from hope the character that seems to have it all you know under control and 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 face everything with a smile and a sarcastic wit um, and of course, it's it's where we were going to see Hunter sort of come into his own and and capitalize on the feelings that maybe give him pause and make him cower in the beginning of the story, find a way to look at them in an empowering lens, an empowering point of view uh, that actually helps him stand up for his friend. So basically, you know, like we're, we're all playing God when we're creating when we're creating books. Uh, but, you know, you, you've got to bake in those journeys uh and 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 make a team that certainly has that strong alchemy or a friend group that has that strong alchemy um but you know what are if you to carry this bizarre metaphor you know what is alchemy alchemy but a combination of of volatile <laughs> volatile compounds uh that, that turn into something good so uh when you're building in faults to characters you're really building in also the resolutions and 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 the, and the happy ending to their journey do you know the ending before you start? Like, are you a full plotter or do you kind of do the fly by your seat of your pants, let the characters tell you where they want to go? Uh, you know, octopuses uh, have semi-independent arms. Um, and, and the reason I'm saying that is that it's not just because I'm obsessed with octopuses, but... You know, if an octopus brain, uh, at least what we consider their brains, they have a lot of brain tissue in their arms for the following reason, says, you know, go pick up that rock. Uh, the arm is going to pick up the rock, but because they're semi-independent, there is a level of autonomy as to how that is achieved uh, by the arm, right? Like, and I know this is once again a tortured metaphor. This is what happens when you bring me on. Um, but it's also kind of the answer. Yeah, Like, yes, we knew where we were going. Uh, you know, especially when you're working on a, something with a publisher, trust me, they do not want to be surprised. Uh, they want to know you have a plan. Um, but then within that, you allow the characters to inform how you get there in the specifics, though. So, so you might know, of course, where we need to end up. But as you build and flesh out the characters, you allow them to inform the journey, even if it was always going to that place that you planned on. One of the things I love about Silver Vessels is it kind of hits that teen market that gets ignored. A lot of the times, so, you know, usually when you see the young adult fiction, you're seeing those older teens where we're already high school seniors, we're dealing with the struggle of getting ready for college or just who I'm going to date and things like that. These kids being so much younger on the teen side, but still having those teen struggles, uh, it, it makes it kind of a refreshing thing. Was there a choice in that making them more of the high school freshman age than the older teen or did it just kind of happen? Well, I mean, the hope was to sort of place them where they were on the on the cusp of quote unquote maturity, which often feels like being jaded, you know, when uh, in your late teens. So, yeah, we wanted them to be young enough to think they could, you know, be able to go on adventures and think they've got it all figured out, but not quite in that mindset, at least not yet. You know, if we come back next summer, much like uh, any other series, um, you know, they're going to be a little older. Um but we didn't want them to be so too cool for school, no pun intended, that this type of adventure almost wouldn't seem to fit. You know, um, yeah, as someone who definitely had no interest in anything anybody wanted me to have interest in when I was like 17, because the very 
idea that someone would suggest it to me made it inherently uncool. Um, you know, I didn't want to yet touch on that point of uh, adolescence and development where people feel a little pre-jaded. Now, of course, they don't know what they don't know, uh, but that's, I think, how a lot of us feel at that age. Um, and rather than maybe having it be this sort of wonder and awe-based journey for people who aren't really in that headspace, now we start them when they're 14, 15. Uh, and then if we do get to come back for sequels, we can engage with that uh, part of their lives and that development emotionally, mentally, in a way that is hopefully really exciting and surprising. And they do, they still have that sense of wonder so much and kind of feel lost at the same time. And so it, it works so well for the story. Um, so we teach monthly, we have comic creation workshops and we teach kids how to understand the writing process through the making of a comic book. Uh, it's something we do a couple of times a month. It's something that we do at schools and everything. Kids love it. It's a great way to get them excited about writing. So some of my kids in the writing workshops always have questions for writers that they want answered. So I have a couple of questions from them. Um, okay. One of them is, how do you research the places that you set your stories in? Uh, well, there's, so the base level of research is very easy in the internet age, uh, you know, and, 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 and sometimes that's enough. Um, in this book, it's not, and we'll get to that in a minute, but sometimes that's enough. Sometimes, you know, quote unquote book research, um, which these days is often uh, online research, but back when I was young was meant opening a book, um, is enough. Uh, if, if the demands of your story are uh, somewhat, how can I put this, like illuminated, uh, you know, like when Disney goes somewhere uh, in, in a movie, uh, in an animated movie, they go to Paris and the Hunchback of Notre Dame, for example, and whatever, um, you get the things that make it feel like Paris, but it's not as though every road exactly matches reality. It's not as though, you know, it's, uh, and so every brick is where every brick is in the real world and so on and so forth. That's an illuminated reality. And oftentimes in comics, that's enough, you know. Um, obviously, New York has probably appeared in more com American comics than any other city. And I would almost guarantee that it, it, there, it, it is a version of reality, but it's not specific uh, until it needs to be, right? Until like a, until a specific skyline or a, a specific location is germane to the story. With this, uh, we're sort of in the middle. You know, we don't need the every bit of land architecture uh, and and layout to match the real keys because this is an illuminated version. But it is a book with a very strong sense of place. So while we do a lot of reading about the forts and the general history, the locations like the southernmost point uh, in the background right now, for folks who understand how to change their zoom background. Um, <laughs> You want a little more. You want that feel because there's an emotional story and an emotional accuracy to the area, too. So, you know, we were lucky in this book. Uh, there, the research comes from direct from, from direct interaction with, with people who felt it, right? Like, quote, unquote, interviews. It's not an interview because I'm speaking with my editor all the time about what feels authentic, what feels real, what maybe needs a polish. Same with uh, the, one of the publishers from Mad Cave who also grew up in the area. Um so in the case of this, when there's an emotional authenticity to the location and the feel, I mean, emotional authenticity is always important, but when it's tied to the place, uh, yeah, you probably want to do uh, find a way to either read first person accounts or get them directly. Uh, we were lucky. We knew from the start we were going to build this up about the keys because the people that came to me with the idea to do the book uh, had that feeling. So yeah, I mean, this was uh, pretty clean. You know, like speak to the editor, uh, Lauren Hitzhausen, uh, speak to Chris Fernandez, who also loves the the keys, uh, and then emulate that feel uh, in the script. Now, if I didn't have them, yeah, you would want to hunt down first person accounts or, or, or maybe try to speak with people uh, who, that you're comfortable speaking to uh, that, that have that first person experience, the authentic experience. But with this book specifically, um, it was baked in from the start because we knew we were doing a book inspired by how the people, my direct collaborators felt about the area. Have you been to the Florida Keys? Me personally, no. I've been to Florida numerous times, uh, but I've not been to the Keys specifically. But, you know, to be frank, that's not necessary. Uh, that, 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 that's what writing is. 
um, the research, uh, of course, and the authenticity is necessary. But that's why we have people on the team that are reviewing uh, and, and noting and polishing to that effect. Um, one of the other kids asked, what is your favorite part of being in the comics industry? Um, I mean, so there, without being schmaltzy, uh, comics are really special because as writers, we're not in charge. We're just the first baton holders. And the real magic happens through collaboration. You know, even if you're a writer artist, you're probably collaborating with someone. Maybe you don't do your own colors. Maybe you don't do your own lettering. Or if you do, uh, you probably have an editor who's helping guide the story, so on and so forth. It's very rare that it's truly a one-person job, though not impossible. Um, the joy there is that your story comes back to you both exactly what you wrote and also vastly different. Uh, you, you, you Only in comics, or I shouldn't say only in comics, but comics are special because you can be surprised by your own work. Uh, you can, you can, as, as your story passes to your, your visual art team, no matter how many people are in that, to your lettering, your production team, all through your editorial team, uh, during, during the production of a book, little changes happen and you end up discovering things within the story that originated with you that you maybe didn't know were there in the first place. And so when it comes back to you and you get that comp or you get that complete PDF, uh, of the book, you really are surprised by your own work. And I think that's really special. Uh, the, the other thing, of course, is, you know, the very simple having first person interactions with people at conventions, at store signings. Um, we're often here, again, stuck in the comics cave. Sometimes we come out during the day uh, and it's it's nice to see for all the work we put in. And it is work. I mean, we bust our asses for this stuff. Uh, it's nice to see that it's that it's reaching people uh, and affecting people. Uh, and that is that is a huge factor. It's one of the best parts of the job. Yeah. What book that you've worked on do you feel had that biggest impact on you um, that kind of taught you the most about yourself? Um, probably Marsh. I mean, my two my two books that I consider my best work are Martian Manhunter from DC and Kill a Man from Aftershock. Um, and that's not to say, I mean, we're here talking about Silver Vessels. Uh, I mean, I don't put a book out if I don't think that it's uh, I've given it everything I can. That being said, if pressed, like the story of Kill a Man and the story of Martian Manhunter are very personal to me. Uh, Martian Manhunter is hard sci-fi, something I love and that we don't get to do a ton in comics and not just that, but it's, uh, in the case of John Jones, it's a bisexual allegory. And in the case of Diane Mead, it's not an allegory. It's, 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 it's a story. Uh, and it allowed me to speak about things that I've gone through that haven't really been talked about in comics before. Um, you know that's not the point of the book. The point of the book is a is the birth of John Jones. That's the the but the seasoning, uh, are, still involves things that I've never seen in a book before. We've never spoken about bisexual erasure, especially from within the the binary gay community. You know, would uh, like Diane has faced, and, and those are things that I faced in my own relationships. Um, and at the same time, I got to pay love to my favorite DC Comics character and give him the respect and journey I've thought he always deserves. Uh, in the case of Kill a Man, it, it's a similar thing. The journey that that character goes on, accepting himself uh, after losing everything uh, as, a, as a price to denying himself. Uh, and, and this uh, a story that sort of shows that there is no real one way to be in the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, it's probably a quote unquote harder a uh, queer story than, than than others that you see out there. It's certainly not a hugging book, um, but at the same time, like it talks about real struggles uh, and also talks about generational struggles in a way that I don't think you see that often. Uh, and it talks about found family. All of these uh, are, are are things that I'm privileged to be able to write about, but especially within my own voice, which, you know, I am a little uh, a little I don't want to say cruder, but I'm a little uh, a little harder and a little less uh, <laughs> nice than other creators when it comes to these things. But the fact is, is that um, it's a story that's always felt really real to me. Uh, and it's a book that were I in my teenage years uh, and had it come out, I, I really would have needed it. So I'm extremely proud of that uh, for wholly different reasons than Martian Manhunter. But the, the, those are probably the two most personal things to me and most affecting. That's amazing. And you definitely do kind of wear your your message on your sleeve in your comics, which I think is wonderful. I think the fact that you 
you know, you're, you're actually saying the things and putting them out there because there's so many people that connect, you know, I've, like I said, I've had uh, teenagers all the way to adults who have come in and said, did, did you, you read this, right? And I'm like, absolutely. And they're like, this is incredible. Like I learned so much about myself or I learned so much about this character. So you're definitely getting those points across and it's, it's really impacting people. So I appreciate that. Um, if you could have been, since you just did Silver Vessels and we're talking about treasure hunting, if you could have been or could be the person who discovers some well-known or less known treasure, is there a treasure that you would go on a treasure hunt for? Well, it's a complicated question, right? Well, just for the reasons that are raised in the book, I, you know, I don't think that's, you know, as the characters learn, there's a, there's a, there's a, a moral question with treasure hunting that we're still trying to answer. And, and all you have to do is go to see all the artifacts that are sitting in like, say any of our major museums or needless to say the British museum that are, really the the spoils of, of empire and conquest uh to me there's really no question where those things belong um so it's hard to answer um that being said i i i, I myself am an egotist who doesn't think he'll have all the time to write all the books that i want to write in however long my life is so i'd have to say it'd be nice to find the fountain of youth uh, um i i do like i do like a warm climate anyway so it'd be it'd be nice to explore there uh, at minimum because uh, you know what I could actually that's a great answer because you don't have to take it all you have to do is see it and experience it uh, and then you know if, if people are sick of my work now they'll be getting it forever. <laughs> well, it may mean a trip to Florida if you're hunting for the Fountain of Youth. There's still sure. Well, I've been to Florida plenty, just not the just not the keys. I mean, with a name like mine, going to Florida can be challenging for patience reasons. Every time I sign a credit card receipt or anything, but I do go. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we have so many people who you know are trying who said I I think I've been to the spot of the Fountain of Youth, and then you of course are like which one because there's so many spots here that are allegedly the fountain of youth but uh if you had to suggest a comic to somebody who's never read a comic before one of yours or one of somebody else's if you were just like this is where you should start what would be the comic that you would put in someone's hand uh i mean that's a challenging question just because comics aren't a genre you know i mean with no shade to the question uh, at all intended. It's it's like saying if you would request a movie or you know, recommend a movie to someone, well, what kind of movies do they like? You know, um, that being said, I, I mean, I'll make it easy. My favorite, my, 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 my favorite comic there is, is Flex Mentallo by, by Grant Morrison and, and, uh, and Frank Whiteley. Um, and I think Dave Barron, but that's off the top of my head. So I'm going to take a, a, a medium cop-out answer because I, you know, you got to at least know what genre people are looking for if they want to get into. But at the same time, if someone asks me, you know, the one book I wish people would read in general, uh, Flex Mentale to me is, is about everything you need to know in life. You know, that's, that's, that's the meaning of life and everything. It's not 42, it's, it's Flex Mentale. So um, that's got to be the answer. Uh, it's not an necessarily easy book to read. It's a little messy. It's not as tight as something like Watchmen, um, but life isn't tight. Life is messy. Uh, and, and the key for me is that it's hopeful. Uh, it, it's about imagination. It's about not losing your verve and, and falling prey to jade, uh, you know, a jaded uh, nature or cynicism and, and sort of being saved by that wonder of your teenage years, which, by the way, it's what we're here talking about anyway. So that's my answer, because uh, without knowing what genre someone's looking for, Flex isn't an easy read. For a first time comic reader, but it is, I think, the book everybody does need to read. Um, and then honestly, the the last question I really have is working with kids, like I said, we have so many who are this is the path they want to go on. They want to be, they want to be writers and they want to specifically do it in the comic industry. A lot of times the first time that a kid makes a comic one of the things they say is I don't know how to draw is anybody ever going to let me make comics so of course we talk about the different roles that there are in the comic industry and how there's so many different ones but 
if you could give one little piece of advice or one long piece of advice, it doesn't have to be little, to those kids and teens who, you know, we're sitting here talking about these teens figuring out themselves, those teens who are figuring out that this is the, the path for them, the medium for them, what piece of advice would you give them to kind of get them excited and started on their journey? Uh, I mean, the first one is don't wait. Uh, I, I started going to conventions with scripts uh, and then completed short stories uh, and pitches when I was 12 years old. Uh, and so so don't wait. Um, if it's a common adage that if you're an artist, you need to draw a thousand bad pages before you draw a good one. Uh, I don't see why that would be any different for for writing. Uh, and, and so start, you know, if this is your love, uh, do it. Right. Uh, my mentor, when I was that age, again, probably the younger than the people we're talking about, told me to write every day uh, and treat this like a job if I ever wanted it to be one. Uh, and and so I did. I mean, I've written every single day since I was 12. Um, and I'm old now, especially compared to these people. So um, but don't wait um, and 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 don't be disheartened if things you know don't happen immediately. Once again, I, I started doing this when I was 12 years old. I didn't start having this be my job that I could pay, you know, in, in a full-time uh, way for uh, until I was 29. So what is that? 17 years. Uh, doesn't have to take that long, you know, to be clear, it can happen much faster, but the point is it can happen. So don't wait um, and, 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 and cake and write every day. If writing is what you want to do, if you want to draw, draw every day, if you want to ink, ink every day, do that thing you want to do, make it a routine and part of your life. And, and you will get better, uh, you know, of course, find people whose opinions you respect uh, and, and who want to help you get better, uh, get critique from them and take it. Um, if you're asking, which I know that sounds obvious, but oftentimes I give critique to people who come to my table and their response is immediately to explain why everything they're doing is already right and why everything I've told them is wrong. I would counter that if that was the case, why am I the published one and why are they asking how to break into comics? So I, I know that sounds obvious, but have an open mind. This is why I say to find people whose work you respect, who have your best interest in mind. When you get critique from those people, take it, be thankful for it, and come back even better than before. And do that uh, until you're ready. And the until you're ready part, again, it might be a year, it might be two or five years. It doesn't need to be the journey I was on, but keep going, know that it can happen um, and know that it's normal to be disheartened. I mean, I quit comics a thousand times, but the thing is, is that you get back on the saddle and you keep trying because the, the thousandth and first time could be the one uh, where where you finally get in. So you, you, you just have to know that um, Everybody has their own journey. There's no set limit. There's no set dues amount to pay. Uh, there's no set sort of diagram or path to take. Um, but I'm sitting here because it can't happen. So, and and the day after you quit could be the day you were going to make it. So keep trying, uh, keep working. And yeah, the, the important thing is keep getting better uh, and, and have that constructive attitude because uh, it, it's heartbreaking when you see someone who does have the raw talent but lacks that constructive attitude to want to improve um, it's, it's honestly probably the most important thing. Awesome. That is fantastic advice and kind of just encapsulates everything that I think people really need to focus on. Um, we are doing our treasure hunt tomorrow and we're going to be talking about silver vessels, which of course I have my copy. Um, but the last question I have completely and totally going back to silver vessels, this is, you know, we talked about the age range and everything that's for, but if you could, Talk about the one, you know, the reader that you hope finds this book and what you hope they take away from it. That would just be amazing. I mean, I hope this is... The treasure hunting in this book is almost tertiary. Uh, you know, it much like, you know, my favorite movie, Creed, is not really a movie about boxing. It's, it's a movie about having this thing you need to do uh, that everyone else thinks is impossible uh, and, and that you can't do. Uh, this is a book about finding your, finding your true community and being empowered within that. It would be, it, it's about trusting your friends uh, with, 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 with information, trusting them with your heart, uh, and being rewarded for it. So so that's who I actually hope. I mean, if I had to pick, yes, it's an adventure book, of course. Um, it's an adventure book with a strong moral heart, but 
it is really about these teens finding each other and, and realizing uh, a deeper understanding and, and love for each other uh, and community. So that's why hope is finding it. If you think that there's no one that could really accept whatever sort of secret you might have or truth you have, secret has a negative connotation, whatever truth you might have, uh, it is about finding the people that will. It's about it, it, making that jump uh, in, in, into trust uh, and being rewarded. Um, and, you know, as well, it's worth pointing out, it's for people who think that maybe there's no one path, maybe there is no path forward for them because the type of life they see for themselves or the type of family they see for themselves isn't the ones they see in media or the ones that they're taught about in school. You can see from this book that family doesn't really look like any one thing uh, and community and friends don't really look like any one thing. Uh, they're all subjective. They're all bespoke to your needs uh, and your world. And so if you think they're, you know, the type of relationships that are in this book are possible, they are. Uh, we're here to show you that. And of course, we're here to show you that in the most exciting way possible. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve, again, for giving us your time and for, for letting me ask you all these questions and for this incredible book and all the books that, that you write. Um, but there's there's so much to unpack in this. And I can't wait to get to share it with more young people tomorrow and throughout the summer as this is going to be one of those summer reads that I think all of the kids need to pick up and, and enjoy. So uh, thank you. And thank you uh, to Anna and Mad Cave for setting this up because it was a lot of fun. It's my absolute pleasure. Uh, and I'm really, really excited for everybody to see the book uh, and enjoy the treasure hunt. Thank you.